and uh, delighted uh, to welcome back all of our Schusterman Fellows and also to welcome many guests who've joined us this morning. I'm Jonathan Sarna, a director of the Schusterman Center, um, and we are in for a fabulous uh, day. Um, the way the day works is first knowing that many of our fellows and others need to give one lecture on the whole phenomenon of startup nation, of innovation in Israel. Um, uh, we invited, and you'll soon hear from Professor Iran Carmel, really to give that model lecture uh, so people can take good notes. Uh, and then we will move uh, to two sessions, one devoted to how we got here, the roots of Israeli innovation, and the second, where we are going. Um, so that's really the outline of the day. All of the biographies are at the back of the pamphlet, uh, but uh, for those who don't know, uh, whenever you hear about Israeli innovation, you'll see Professor Carmel quoted. He is professor uh, at American University School of Business. He was the dean and the department chair, and long before others were interested in the subject of innovation in Israel. Uh, he was following the subject and really has, as you will see, full mastery of uh, innovation in Israel. And uh, when he calls it a thoughtful overview, that means, uh, unlike some people, he's thought carefully about it. Uh, I was supposed to remind you, by the way, that today is April Fool's Day. Uh, we didn't have any fools, except perhaps the director, uh, to entertain you, uh, but uh, we are delighted to think uh, that uh, we here at the Schusterman Center turn folly into thoughtfulness. Professor Aaron Carmel. Nice opening. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, and we even have, uh, in honor of April Fools, we even have kosher water. <laughs> yeah, all right. So all the technology is working. All right, so here, I, I want this to be very much like a classroom. It, it can be interactive. Um, I welcome interruptions, but I will answer briefly and we'll leave longer discussions for the end. So by all means, interrupt me or ask me questions if I get too deep into the business speak, uh, which I might. I'm a business professor. Um, my scholarship has been, over the last 25, 30 years, has, uh, I label it as the globalization of technology. So these are the three books I've written over the years, and they all have to do with how uh, companies and teams and uh, really societies have been working across borders and globally. Um, so that's, that's the context I bring to my, uh, my uh, talk here today about Israel and about innovation in Israel. I see it very much as a globalist, and of course as one that you can tell by the name that I grew up in Israel, so I know Israel quite well. All right, so in the, in the um, spirit of this being in the university, we're gonna start with a pop quiz. Um, get out your blue books, and let's see if you can answer this first question. What is an exit? Who would like to be the brave person who answers that? What's an exit? You have to understand exit to understand Israeli innovation. What is that? Yes, please, over here. I think that it's to sell your business after you have developed it to a point that somebody else can take it and make money out of it and 
and they are willing to pay you something that you think is worthwhile. Very good, very good. And uh, we have a slide with a good definition of it. By the way, I'm, I'm happy to share the slides if any of you want this. So um, the, the second question is, what big exit happened just a few weeks ago in Israel? It's for extra credit. Yes, please. Yes, Melanox. Very good. And it was, uh, I, I recall, $5.7 billion. We're pretty close. And, uh, Full credit. And uh, <laughs> it was hardly even worth mentioning that it was Israeli, because by this time it's almost normal for something like that to happen, which amazed me that there's a Wall Street Journal, oh, by the way, it's Israeli. Can you hear him over there in the back? Okay, so the, the gentleman um, uh, said correctly, uh, very close to the correct number, and um, I think you made a very nice observation that uh, that, that you, you noticed that they didn't mention that it was Israeli because it's so normal, and I think that that's uh, a very nice observation. So, all right, so the answer to the question. So an exit, as this gentleman said, is to sell the firm's ownership uh, or part or whole of it or whole to investors. So that could be an IPO. What's an IPO? I'll answer that uh, after the quiz. IPO is an initial public offering. That's when you your company goes and is traded on the, on the stock exchange, whether it be in the United States or in Israel. Um, and it could also be purchased by another company, which has been happening much more often these days. So that's an exit. And Israelis talk a lot about exit. They say, Kama exit imasita? And so exit has become an Israeli word. Um, and uh, the, uh, the big exit that just happened, which is the uh, really, the, the second largest exit that ever happened in Israel of high-tech companies just happened a few weeks ago. It's Mellanux, which makes um, chips. It's just outside Haifa in Yoknam. And uh, they had um, a majority of the market share of the world in uh, chips that are called InfiniBand, which are network chips. Um, so they're very important to running all the networks around the world. All right, so the, my, my talk is about innovation. So first, what is innovation? Well, innovation is this term that's, uh, that's been used more and more in recent decades. You can see here this, this chart from Google. Uh, this, Google uh, looks at books, and so this ends in 08, uh, but I think is, is still very instructive. It's a concept that we in our society, we talk about a lot more today in our generation than we did one or two generations ago when they talked about the concept of invention. And there's a, a difference between innovation and, and, and invention. Here's a more recent chart also from Google. Um, this is just a, over a few years. I know you can't read the x-axis. It, be, it begins in 04, so it's uh, just the last 15 years or so. But notice uh, that it, it's, it's steadily increasing, probably by about 25%, I I, eyeballing it. So this is a concept that it's become more and more uh, a part of our, our discourse, uh, not only in business, but, but everywhere. So what really is innovation? Well, there's thousands and thousands of definitions of innovation. Every professor has his or her own definition of innovation. Um, here's a pretty good one. Um, it's anything that's new or useful or surprising. But really, many people define innovation as something that has to do not just with the invention, but also with implementing it, at least to some extent. All right, so here's what I'm going to cover. Um, I'll talk about Startup Nation. And yes, I purposefully Germanized it by putting the two words together. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two academic concepts, which I think help us frame this Startup Nation very nicely, uh, National System of Innovation, NSI and then put briefly about agglomeration, and then I'll assess the startup nation, I'll talk about the bad outcomes, and if we have time, we'll talk about success stories, and a little bit, uh, just a few of my, my thoughts about teaching. Now again, um, interrupt me, ask me questions, I, I want this to be interactive. All right, so let me frame this as follows. I, I've heard from people here, some people I've discussed this with, and people in academia, and people in Israel, they're sick of hearing about Start of Nation. It's overdone. So I want to frame it like this. We, or at least some of us, are, are tired of hearing about this. Um, let's see if, if there's some truth to that. Um, so that, that's really what I want us to think about together. Start of Nation is, is now 
quite common. This is this is from the Startup Nation website, which is a very good source of information. Oh, by the way, um, here's the Startup Nation book uh, by, um, by Sinor and Singer. It's a very good book. Um, I'll pass this around. Uh, so there's um, Startup Nation is around us. There's a Startup Nation uh, website, and there's the uh, Startup Nation fairs. I abbreviated this, and I I uh, should have changed that to it's not Sun. Um, is so uh, as you can see, there was a Startup Nation fair uh, not too far from here at Northeastern. There's what there was at Stanford. Uh, the Startup Nation fair was at Amer my my university, the American University, just last week. Uh, this is a tour that happens. Maybe they come here to Brandeis. I'm not seeing any heads, so I assume not, but they're clearly coming locally. So there's a lot of discussion around Startup Nation. So how did this all get started? When did Israel become the Startup Nation? I think that that's a key question we need to ask ourselves and one that I want to answer. There's two key dates here, two key events. One is uh, 93 Yuzma, which in Hebrew means initiative, and the other is um, in 98, the Mirabilis exit. So let me talk about each, mostly about Yuzma. I'll quote Orna Berry, she, I'll read this to you. John Lennon once said about the early years of rock and roll, before Elvis, there was nothing. On the success of venture capital and high-tech entrepreneurship in Israel, to paraphrase Lennon, before Yuzma, there was nothing. Ona Berry headed uh, the office of the chief scientist of, in Israel for, in the late uh, 1990s, and this is quoted in the Startup Nation uh, book. I think it's a very apt quote. So let me take, tell you about this Yuzma, why, why it's so important, why this is the, one of the keys to making Israel the Startup Nation. Yuzma was an initiative by the government coming out of the uh, what was uh, then called the Office of the Chief Scientist, of $100 million in government money, that's a lot of money, uh, to set up a government-owned VC, venture capital fund. All right, so this is not a business class, so I have to, um, um, it's not par part of the quiz, but I'll, I'll try to capture what a venture capital fund is. A venture capital fund is a fund where typically wealthy individuals, very wealthy individuals or institutions put in chunks of money, typically millions of dollars, and that the, a few people in that fund sit around and make a decision about where to invest in these startups. They're very risky startups. They typically have just a handful of people working for them. The investments are very, very risky. Banks don't make these kind of investments because they're so risky. Only maybe the rule of thumb is one out of 10 um, return the money, if that. Um, and you're banking on a few big hits. Um, so that's why it's called venture, otherwise known as risk capital. Um, so uh, that's, that's uh, the institution that, was, uh, that venture capital is. So Yuzma was a fund of funds, and what they did is they required uh, each of these funds to find foreign matching money to come in and um, $80 million of that went to these funds that uh, had to um, match foreign money. Uh, they were 10 private venture capital companies. They each had to match at least $12 million with foreign funds from outside of Israel. And another $20 million was set aside as a government-owned fund where they made the decisions directly and, and managed uh, and invested into startups. And as I said, Yuzma was uh, launched by the Office of the Chief Scientist. All right, let's look at the results. Within just the decade of the 1990s, which was a good one for startups, I hope you can see all these numbers here, but especially the ones at the bottom. Um, so first of all, the column at the left are the names of the um, 10, um, of the, sorry, of the 12 original um, funds, um, many of which are still around. And um, notice the, uh, the bottom, you can see it's colored a little bit. The, um, the, uh, the summary statistics are very impressive. Um, in total, um, in total the, um, the, the total capital that they um, collected was $280 million. 
over here at the bottom left. And uh, total Israeli VC-based funds that were raised during that time were $6 billion. That's a, it's a lot of money then. It's still a lot of money today. Uh, there were um, 779 firms that were created out of startups that were created out of this uh, fund of funds. And 27% of them had exits. In other words, a quarter of them had uh, a successful exit. They sold themselves out. That's the measure of success. I'm going to come back to this again and again. This measure of success is the exit. And a quarter of them had an exit. That's a lot. Again, uh, back to what I just said a, a minute or two ago, only about one in 10, a rule of thumb, actually have an exit. So a quarter of them had an exit. This is a very, uh, a very good batting average. So, Yuzma was very successful within a fairly short amount of time. The, um, the important institution here that, was, that came out of the government is the Office of the Chief Scientist. Um, Orna Berry later managed it. She was not at the point where um, Yuzma had it. Yuzma was launched. Um, more recently, the OCS changed their name, finally, to the um, Israel Innovation Authority, IIA. Uh, in 2016, they changed their name, and now they are part of the Ministry of the Economy in Israel. Um, I, it's, I, I, like, I like this terminology, um, and so I'll point out that the Office of the Chief Scientist very much reflects the old way of thinking about the concept that we're talking about here, innovation. It was all about science, not about technology. Um, the, uh, the concept OCS is not something that the Israelis invented. In fact, if you go to the USDA in Washington, where I come from, there is an OCS, an Office of the Chief Scientist at the USDA. So this is something that's, that's very international, but really in terms of terminology, captures some old thinking. And um, the uh, Israeli Innovation Authority is in, in, involved in a lot of things. Um, one of the notable things is it started 28 incubators in the last few years, spread out all over Israel in all kinds of business verticals, from healthcare and to media and so on. Um, just last week, one of my buddies in Carmiel sent me this, a very proud uh, initiative that he was very proud of, and I saw that was funded by the, or backed by the IIA, the Israeli Innovation Authority, and this is a a labor meat, meeting market in meat market in in Kamiel, uh, in nor northern Israel in the Western Galilee, um, that um, uh, for uh, companies and uh, and uh, individuals who are looking for jobs to meet and develop high tech in Kamiel in the Western Galilee, or the north. So the IA is involved in a lot of things. So the IA as as an instrument of the state of the nation is very much involved and, um, tr in the innovation in Israel. Very different from what we see here in the United States. All right, so that was Yuzma. The other big event that happened in the 1990s that catalyzed Israel as a startup nation is this. In 1998, Israelis woke up in the morning, one morning in June, and they opened up their newspapers. Uh, remember, there were actually newspapers back then. People read their they got their morning paper, and they read that there were four 20-somethings who were running this tiny little company. One of them even had dreadlocks. I mean, they looked like, um, they looked a little bit freaky, right? Um, so, and, and they just got $400 million from this giant American tech company called AOL. Um, and um, this was a real wake-up moment for everybody in Israel, that you could really make it big with innovation. Um, Mirabilis made a product called ICQ, which was, in, which was basically one of the first instant messaging product, products. Um, it was very successful. And the, um, the older adult who was uh, guiding them, Yossi Vardi, who is very well known today in the Israeli venture capital community, he coined the phrase uh, that became a meme afterwards. ICQ was, was running this instant messaging um, forum with uh, without taking any money from anybody, so he coined the, the phrase, no, no revenues, no problem. Um, he still got $400 million for it. Now, clearly we could point to other important events over the years of Israel and in terms of innovation. We could go all the way back to the, the founding of the Technion and then Albert Einstein paid a visit 
and then uh, the, the founding of the big four defense companies, which are very important in Israel in terms of defense tech and all the spin-offs that they have had over the years, the Rafael, IMI, which stands for Israeli Military Industries, IAI, Israel Aircraft Industries, and Elbit. And then there's the old adage, which, uh, which you hear a lot when you hear these kind of talks, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that, that there's a lot of truth to that, all the way from the mythology of the Davidka, the mortar that was used in 1948, to Iron Dome, which is an, an amazing technology that protects Israel today against mortars from Gaza. And even now, even more recently, the tunnel technology, the, a lot of it which was developed um, in Israel to protect against tunnels. Um, and then you, uh, many people also point, and I think correctly, to um, Dov Fruman, uh, a very, very talented engineer who worked with some of the founders of Intel in, in Silicon Valley, and at some point insisted to them, I want to move back to Israel, and I want to open up an, uh, an Intel R&D facility in Israel. But this was back in the 70s, so during the time of the Yom Kippur War. It was probably, they thought he was crazy, but he did it. And, uh, and Intel, as you are probably aware, is one of the largest tech companies in Israel and has spun off many successes in Israel. All right, so let's come to the academic framing of the of innovation in Israel case. I, um, so I want to kind of not go too heavy into the academic, but I think it's, it's a, good, uh, a good way to see this. So there's two things I want to talk about, the National System of Innovation, the NSI, and agglomeration. Let's start with NS, NSI. So what is NSI, National System of Innovation? It's a concept that we use today. Um, and in the 70s and 80s, we might have talked about technology policy. And I think that in many, uh, many places, you still read about technology policy at the state level, at the national level, the country level. Um, it's a concept of, developed by a Brit named Chris, uh, Chris Freeman. It's the idea that NSI is the flow of technology and information among people, enterprises, institutions, which lead to the innovative process on the national level, and I'm not sure if that really sunk in, but let me tell you what uh, the term that I really like and the term that I think that we heard yesterday from our speakers, it's ecosystem. What Israel did very successfully is build an ecosystem. So now let me show you a formal picture of that. Ecosystem, this is the NSI as depicted by the United Nations um, Commission on um, Trade and Development, UNCTAD, and, um, they did a horrible job of depicting it. I read really it, so I took out all the messiness of it. But envision, envision these dozen circles with lots of um, arrows connecting all of them, like uh, the, uh, an arrow connecting every, every one to, a, to another one. And you, uh, you get a sense of what it is when we talk about an ecosystem or a system of innovation, where all these units within a, within a country are all communicating very effectively with each other. They're trading with each other, they're meeting with each other, they're exchanging knowledge, they're teaching each other. Um, and all of that has to hum for the nation to be innovating. Not everyone, not every circle here has to be perfect. Um, every country does this differently. But they have to be interacting, they have to be uh, working with each other well. Um, let me just um, go very briefly through the circles. Uh, at the top left, we have the government policies. We already heard about Yozma as, a, as an important government policy. FDI stands for Foreign Direct Investment. And then we, of course, have trade. Um, research networks are um, networks between scientists to exchange information. Going down to the bottom right, we have money. Money is, uh, makes the world go around. There's banks and VC, venture capital. In the bottom is the markets. And in the bottom left is infrastructure which is really table stakes for innovation. And that's things like roads and networks and so on. Reliable power supply. Um, in the middle, we have uh, the education system, uh, which I think that um, Dr. Flug already talked about yesterday. Uh, we have business and we have research centers, which could be from universities or they could be government or they could be other research centers. In the middle there, we have that magic that we want to create at the level of the country, innovation. Now, picture this as the nirvana of a country. If you get this right at the level of a country, then all of your units are working and you're innovating and you're creating wealth and happiness in your country. This is the nirvana, the, the holy grail, if you will. 
In Israel, since this was done by the UN, they didn't have Israel in mind exactly when they did this, and they omitted one key part of the model for Israel, and that's the Israeli military. And I won't, sp I won't spend a lot of time on this because I think that here you and the audience are quite familiar with that special sauce of the Israeli military, but let me just mention a couple of things, which is one is the culture that comes out of the military and the ability of Israelis to work in, in small units and to get things done quickly. And the other is the knowledge, and today it's the knowledge that comes out of elite units like the 8200 unit, uh, the intelligence and, and computing unit, which has spun off hundreds and hundreds of, of startups from its uh, young, very talented people. Israel is able to pick the cream of the cream of uh, the, uh, the Israeli uh, graduates of high school and put them into these units, and then they, be, uh, they learn things very, very quickly. So um, if, for the case of Israel, I add, add another circle here, another oval. Okay, good so far, no questions? Okay, let's move on. So the, the next, the thing, the next uh, framing of NSI, National System of Innovation, is that at least in theory, it comes from the state, the national policy, and it's a slow, incremental, stage-by-stage, uh, step-by-step movement from being very backward to being very innovative. Um, so it's, uh, it's the notion of playing catch-up to catch up to the great technology countries of the world, the United States being the foremost country. It's linear and, it's, uh, and you grow by, the, by tech transfer. Tech transfer is a horrible term that is used in my business and has been used for half a century. It's about transferring knowledge. Um, so the, uh, the countries that are not the premier technology companies, they, they gain knowledge from the, the ones who possess that knowledge. So this is the, the theory. Um, in Israel, nothing worked according to theory. Uh, the Israelis moved from being um, a country that by all measures had very little innovation. There was very little uh, R&D. Uh, you see that in the bullet point in the middle in the 1960s relative to, to GDP, very little R&D. By the 1990s, Israel had one of the highest ratios of um, R&D relative to GDP. And Brezhnev, who, uh, Danny Brezhnev, who's written a lot about this, he had a nice sentence in one of his papers. He wrote, in Israel, state and industry, state being the nation, of course, have managed to perform int an intricate dance, I like that choice of words, of intricate dance of development as partners, helping and assisting each other, not as competitors for control and, juris and jurisdiction. So coming back to this slide here, <clears throat> all these entities are collaborating and competing with each other, and it's an intricate dance. And not every country does this well. Some country, in some countries it's too competitive, in some countries it's perhaps too collaborative, and they're not um, competing enough with each other. And so Israel did this well. Um, all right, so in practice, what happened, what we can learn from the theory uh, is that uh, the innovation in Israel has developed where the, um, the startup cluster um, is um, let me start with the, with the words that I used at the bottom. The VC and the startups are now the key components of the Israeli national system of innovation. Um, and I think that that's the important thing to recognize here. Um, there really is no key important foundation for the Israeli innovation system today besides the startups. And Avni Melech, who wrote about uh, quite a number of papers about this in the last 20 years, already began to recognize this. He wrote about this. This is the 2009 quote that I give here. And um, he had kind of similar statements a few years before that. Um, so it's the notion that, the, that there is a startup intensive cluster in Israel. It's all about the startups. Let's look at a few numbers now. Well, we're moving away from the academic theoretical stage models and frameworks to more uh, businessy slides now. Here's the venture capital raised each year. Now, this is just over the last five years. And so what you see here is a doubling just in the last five years. It's, that's actually very impressive. So the numbers there are, um, are good. Uh, this is the number of VC deals per year. So as you can see, it's, a, it's roughly a steady state of about 600 deals per year. A deal is 
Um, is uh, VC give, handing over five, 10, maybe $40 million to a startup? Um, so each one of those is a deal. Some Israelis are concerned that the, this is relatively flat, this particular chart, um, and we can discuss that later. Okay, a few more observations about venture capital. One is that in the 1990s, most of the funds were coming from foreign sources, but that's changed. And now there are quite a number of Israeli firm venture capital companies that are very professional, very experienced, and are uh, doing the funds. I've listed the top five here, uh, beginning with um, our crowd, um, which has a very interesting model of innovation. Maybe uh, there's, a, there's probably a couple of you who are invested through our crowd here. It's a very de democratic way to invest where not just super wealthy individuals can invest, but more people like you and me. I, I, I'm invested through our crowd, and I was invited to a reception uh, right next to um, uh, the APAC meeting last week uh, by the founders of our crowd, and uh, they, they managed to invite the, uh, the new mayor of Jerusalem there, Moshe Leon, and Moshe Leon sat there um, in front of hundreds of people who are all investors in our crowd, and he said that Jerusalem has 700 startups just in Jerusalem alone. Um, that seems, I was a little bit skeptical, but, um, but he's, he has to sell a city, so. Um, another observation at the bottom bullet point is that the Chinese are now investing a lot in Israeli startups and Israeli companies. So yesterday, uh, Guido Norgorov mentioned uh, that a little bit, and I'll add to that. Um, I think that that's, that's uh, positive. Uh, we see a lot of activity around the, the Chinese investments, but that's also a, somewhat of a cause for concern. Just uh, two weeks ago, RAND, uh, the American RAND think tank, came out with a study that cautioned the American national security establishment uh, about the uh, the close ties between the Israelis and the Chinese, including the Chinese are now building the new port uh, of, uh, in my home city of Haifa. And so that's a bit of a cause for concern, and not, not just the port, but all the other investments. Another thing I want to emphasize is that Israel's innovation sector is multi-sectoral. Again, something that was mentioned yesterday. It's, it's quite impressive how uh, the Israeli uh, innovation system is not focused just on one or two verticals, but on really across the board. And so it's IT and the web and biotech and agricultural technology and medical and AI, which is artificial intelligence and military and automotive mobility. I have some examples. And there's FinTech, which is financial technology, kind of Wall Street stuff, and even all kinds of oddball things like cannabis and gambling. So um, it's all over the place. Here's just an example from one of the many brochures and websites about Israeli innovation. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you in a second, it, and it shows the agricultural innovation. I like the, this, the second one from the left. Um, it shows uh, um, drones being used for, uh, for agricultural um, implementations. Yes, somebody had a question. We've got a man over there that had a question. Thank you. But I have a question after. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the VCs that you mentioned, Israeli VCs. Do they... Is there any statistics about how much of their funds are going to investing within Israel versus maybe looking at other markets and investing in there? Thank you. I can, I can just repeat it so, so everybody hears. I just asked the Israeli VCs that we see, do they invest only in Israel or also else? going elsewhere. I, I don't have the statistics, but yes, some, some of the Israeli VCs, including the ones that are mentioned here, invest outside of Israel. Um, Anecdotally, I think that most of their investments are inside Israel, uh, but I don't have the numbers. Yes, uh, uh, back there, yes. So, you know, what's reported in the newspapers is that uh, if you take your business to China, you have to do turn over your tech to them. So how do, does Israel avoid that, or, or does Israel allow the innovation of uh, Does Israel just allow the Chinese to have the innovation that they develop. Yeah, it's a, it's a point of controversy just as it is here in the United States. Um, how much of what's called the intellectual property of the company, that the, the secrets of the company are transferred to the Chinese. The Chinese are, are very good at, at taking that, uh, that knowledge from abroad and then turning it into their own products and competing with 
Um, and, and so that, that's clearly happening. All right. Um, let me then move on to, um, remember we're trying to assess innovation and the startup nation in Israel. So one, one key thing is to try to compare it with other countries. So I, I chose some peer countries and some nations, some aspirational nations in the case of Israel. Um, and uh, the, down there the, where, where I mentioned the three eyes when I was, began talking about all of this stuff back in the 1990s, uh, all of us in, in this space, all over the world, would used to talk about the three stars of the 1990s. The th these, in, the, in, the, in the globe where only the US and France and Britain had any technology, suddenly there were these three small stars in that, in that global landscape, and they all began with the letter I. It was India, Ireland, and Israel. And so um, Ireland was one of those three eyes. Let's, let's, so let's talk briefly about each of them. Let's start with the country that you, you know best, the National System of Innovation here in the United States. What is it? Um, how does it work here? Why are we innovating here in the United States? Um, so just briefly, because I see that um, uh, I have to hurry. Um, really, the, uh, the, the, the state as being an actor began after World War II, where, where America began to be the uh, arsenal of, uh, of democracy for the world and for itself. And a lot of it came out of the defense. Uh, and as you know, uh, defense uh, spun off some very important inventions, the internet, GPS, and many others, that things that we couldn't even imagine living without today, they all came from government-funded defense programs. All right, so um, I'll move on to this, the second and last slide about the US, which is this. Martin Kenny wrote a very nice article in, um, in the Harvard Business Review a few years ago. And I, 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 I want to read that first bullet point here, which I think is key vis-a-vis -vis our discussion about Israel. Today, VC has become the key pillar of the NSI, the National System of Innovation, here in the United States. Okay, so students, what, what did we just say about Israel? The pillar of innovation in Israel is the startup and venture capital, and that's the same thing that's happening here in the United States. And I think that that's, that's a key for our understanding as we look at, at this country that we're interested in, which is Israel. That's what's happening here in the US too. Um, most new firms that have become large cap, large capitalization means big, um, are VC-based. Think of the 1980s stars like um, Genentech, which is a biotechnology company, and um, Apple and Sun and Oracle, which are IT companies, of course. So the c companies today often innovate by acquisition, and that's what we're seeing with Israel. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, big tech companies, they don't have the central R&D labs. Uh, you know, what I always have in my mind is I think of, um, of Thomas Edison in his Menlo Park, New Jersey, uh, big lab, um, doing invention after invention after invention, and, and he, he was the one who institutionalized this notion of R&D. Um, that's, that's happening a lot less today in the United States, uh, certainly not at Cisco very much, but even in companies like Google and Intel, they, they're innovating through acquisition. They're, they're buying these small, very innovative startups in, in the United States, in Israel, and all over the world, and that's how they innovate. They buy innovation. Um, only about 8% come out directly out of universities. And um, most of the innovation that they buy is in ICT and biotech, um, but there are some areas which um, are not getting um, attention in that community, in innovation, and um, transportation is one of them. And that's why we need the government to continue to be involved in those kind of national infrastructure projects. Um, Sweden is another success case. Um, Sweden is always ranked high. Stockholm is always ranked, ranked high as an innovation city, as a startup city with its incubators. Uh, Sweden has very good national coverage of, uh, of uh, broadband, uh, much cheaper than we have in the United States. And uh, the Swedes only work for six hours a day. Um, let me move on quickly to Singapore. Singapore innovates. Um, uh, here's, here's two cases that actually move through that stage model that I showed you about 10, 15 minutes ago. And that's uh, the case of Singapore and Ireland, which I'm coming to next. So Singapore um, first brought in multinational corporations, MNCs, multinational corporations, to, um, through tax incentives to do low-end uh, 
low-end work and then slowly moved up those steps, those stages, to where now they do some, inno some more innovation. They see themselves very much as a gateway to Asia, and they, a lot of their innovation uh, is around their port city. Singapore, of course, is one of the great port cities of the world. Ireland, a much smaller country, you know, about half the population of, of Israel, um, again, in the, up, th up through the 1990s, was very much focused on low-end manufacturing that was lured into Ireland by, l by low taxes, by the government. Um, but now it's a gateway to Europe. Uh, it's, it's a comfortable place. It's English-speaking. Very low corporate tax rates. That's very important to companies and their decision-making. <clears throat> last example is Chile, where I spent my last sabbatical. And, and w one of the reasons I went there is Chile didn't have a culture of innovation at all. Um, very... Uh, uh, in spite of it being a relatively developed country for Latin America, and what Chile did successfully back in 2011 is they, they did something experimental. They, they did something called Startup Chile, where they opened up an accelerator in the heart of Santiago, and they invited foreign uh, entrepreneurs. They gave them essentially a check for $40,000, and they said, here, you have to spend six months here in Santiago, um, and you have to start a business here. Here's $40,000, go. Um, and it was very successful. Within, about, within several years, they had 1,000 entrepreneurs who, who picked up on this offer. And, um, and they created a startup culture at the national level. Within about, uh, by my estimate, within about 36 months, they had accelerators and incubators in every single university in Chile and in many other centers uh, all over Chile. Cities did it and so on. So um, this was an interesting experiment. All right, so we, we covered national systems of innovation. Briefly, agglomeration. Agglomeration is a fancy ac economic uh, term that economists like to use. It basically means clustering in, in cities. And Israel is basically one big cluster, very much like two other tech clusters that I know well, the Bay Area, with, along with Silic which includes Silicon Valley and Washington, greater Washington. Um, Israel is a cluster. You can see from the population, it's about roughly equal to population, and it's actually a little bit smaller in terms of geographic size than those two clusters. We can see Israel as one big tech cluster. <clears throat> um, and why, why is clustering, why is agglomeration important? It's important for two reasons. One is the density shortens the distance for people to meet. Um, they can meet uh, in face-to-face -face meetings, and they can also meet ad hoc at the cafes, at their their kids' uh, daycare center, wh wh wherever they, they happen to meet, those, those chance meetings are very important to creating networks and transferring knowledge. And then there's the network effect, that the value of each node in the network increases with the number of nodes in that network. And so we, we see that very much in the case of Israel. Israel ha definitely um, has that network effect. I'm sick of hearing about Startup Nation, um, so let me do an interim assessment here. Um, Based on the assessment that I looked at, um, I think that Israel has actually done a, a very good job with its startup nation. It has put together a national system of innovation that is humming and it works. It's certainly got flaws. I might come to, I'm, I'll get to that. Um, but it's, it's working very nicely. Um, this is the, the map. Um, I added the military circle there for the special case of Israel. Um, I think it's a, a successful a successful case. Um, let's assess the outcomes a little bit more precisely. How do we assess the success of this startup nation, of this innovation? Um, we uh, look at the sector itself. We look at the national economy that's it, that it's in, because that's really what we care about. It's not for the sake of having exits in startups. It's because in order to create um, national wealth and happiness. And we look at it relative to other nations. So yesterday, um, Dr. Flug, I'm sure, talked to you about um, Israeli uh, growth in the economy. Um, she did not so show slides, I think, so um, I, I missed her talk. I, my plane was late. Um, so here's just a quick slide. Israel is the red line. I know you can't see all the, the readings there. Israel is the red line, and that's the important thing for you to see is that relative to the United States and relative to the world average, Israel has grown over the last 20 years very nicely as a national economy with high tech as its engine of growth. Very much this growth and this stability in the Israeli economy is driven by the success of its high tech innovative sector. 
Um, another measure of success is the startup density, which, uh, looking at the slide, is astounding in Israel. Uh, there's one startup for every 1,400 people. And uh, that's five times more than the UK, that's 10 times more than France, and 20 times more than Germany. Another measure of success is exits. Uh, these are the large exits of the last 20 years. Uh, for Israel, these are big numbers. The largest one is Mobileye, which is the um, automotive company based in Jerusalem. I'll, I'll mention that uh, in a few minutes. Okay, skip that one. Um, another measure of success is the IPOs uh, in, in the American stock exchange called the NASDAQ. Um, Israeli tech has historically um, gone public in the American exchanges for all kinds of reasons, but what's interesting is that Israel is the, has been consistently the number two country on the NASDAQ uh, for now 20 years and consistently has 60, 70, 80 Israeli companies that are traded on the U.S. Uh, exchange called the NASDAQ. Um, and that's a, that's a nice mark of success. Another uh, mark of success in a very different way is the STEM virtual cycle, a virtuous cycle. Um, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. And what we see here is that the top computer science programs in Israel at um, the Technion, uh, the uh, Tel Aviv University, and uh, the Weizmann Institute all are ranked very highly in the uh, Shanghai uh, rankings of uh, world universities. I'm sorry about this flickering, is it getting worse? Um, okay. Another assessment is employment. One of the reasons that we want an innovative sector is that it will employ people and give them meaningful jobs that are well-paying. And in Israel, what we see here in the slide and the statistics is that about a quarter of a million people are directly employed in Israel in the high-tech sector, and that's about 8% of the labor force, and that's double what it is here in the United States. That's, that's quite a significant difference. All right, so that's the good part. Um, yesterday from Dr. Flug and from Gidon Argov, you already heard a little bit of some of the things that are not quite working uh, as well. I'll, I'll go over this quickly, and then I think um, We'll have time for a few minutes of, of discussion and questions. All right, so here are some of the things that I think are uh, some of the worrisome outcomes of the startup nation. Uh, the uh, income inequality, the, uh, the scaling, the shutdown nation, the bubble, and uh, you'll see the last one. All right, so uh, the income inequality we heard about yesterday, I think, uh, a bit, but here's a nice slide of it. Uh, you see in the last uh, five, six years, that the bottom line, the blue line in the middle, is, um, is the average wages for most Israelis. They're completely flat. They have not been going up. However, in the high-tech sector, that's the top line there. That's been going up. In fact, that's gone up um, eyeballing that. I don't have the precise number, but that's about 20% just in the last five years, which is significant. So there has been a lot of income disparity. Um, yesterday I spoke to Dr. Flug, is she here? Yeah, and uh, you had a very nice interpretation of, of this, is that it's not the high-tech high sector uh, that, that is really uh, the cause of this, but the disparities in education in Israel. So it's, it's a more foundational, causal reason for this, um, rather than the high-tech sector by itself. And I, and I like that explanation. So thank you, Dr. Fluke, for that. Um, some numbers on, on these, uh, that uh, the income disparities managed, ma measured uh, very nicely by the Gini coefficient. Um, so those of you who have taken Econ 101, you've encountered this. Um, and the Gini coefficient for Israel is not good. It's one of the worst for OECD countries. And Israel has recently been joined by the United States as being amongst the worst. Uh, of OECD countries, those are the, the OECD are the, the wealthiest uh, countries in the world, and you can see some comparisons there. Turkey and Chile are also pretty bad, and uh, amongst the better ones are France and Finland. 
another cause of concern for from the nation from startup nation is is this I'll show you two headlines is that there's maybe been too much success there have been too many exits I I introduced exit at the very beginning of this talk very much on purpose because exit is such a defining concept in Israeli startup um, milieu. So Israel's tech identity crisis, startup nation or scale up nation, because Israeli companies sell themselves out, they never grow to become really big, large companies, the kind of companies that we're used to here in the United States in this enormous country that we live in here. Um, Israelis don't grow those kind of companies. Here's another headline. Um, Israel's startup nation is under threat from tech giants that nurtured it. So, so many companies are coming in and buying out those startups that that is a, a, a cause for concern. And here's, here's some reasons why. Foreign multinationals are sapping the multiplier effect of having innovation in Israel. When there's a, you can see there in the framed area there, um, when there's an Israeli startup in the country itself, um, about two jobs are created for every one employee in the Israeli-owned startup. Uh, once a foreign multinational flies in and buys that startup, then roughly um, only one-third of a job is created for every one employee. That's a pretty big difference. And why is that? That's because it's in the typical capitalist system. They suck out all those extra profits out of Israel, and they keep it in their home country, whether it be the United States or China or Europe. Um, and they also don't provide the, the, the next layer of service jobs around uh, that, uh, that, that, that company. So Israel has very much become an R&D uh, lab of the world. The Israeli model is to sell, its, to sell startups at a fairly young age and um, to continue as R&D centers for those multinationals. Um, my, uh, my friend uh, Nitsan uh, coined this, so I named this, this uh, after him. This is what I call Nitsan ceiling is that Israeli firms cannot grow to, about, to more than about $5 billion in value. And why is that? Because it's so difficult from Israel to manage um, global marketing and distribution and support network from Israel for a giant company. And so eventually they level out and they sell or they make an exit. And now there are a few exceptions to Nitsan's ceiling, but really just a few. Checkpoint, the cybersecurity company being one but really just a few. And Mellanox is an example of hitting that uh, needs on ceiling. Uh, another worrisome area is the shutdown nation. As you can see here, if you look at the slide, um, the red is the companies that are closing, the startups that are closing, and that number is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so there's some discussion around this. Um, I'll skip over that. I'm, I'm less concerned about that. When you have thousands of startups in Israel, as you do, um, there are going to be a lot of shutdowns. Another concern is that this is all a bubble. Just like we saw those of us who are old enough uh, 20 years ago, this all popped and it will pop, my, my, my guarantee. Um, we just don't know when and how it, what it will look like, but it will pop. Um, so that's a concern. How will Israel be affected but when, once the bubble does pop? And speaking of words that begin with a P, Americans have a tough time pronouncing the word, the Israeli word for traffic, or traffic jam, which is, um, if you do, try to practice this, if you don't speak Hebrew, pkak. Um, and so uh, one of the outcomes of this, this wealth generation of high tech in Israel is the horrible traffic. Uh, both OECD and the IMF have pronounced Israel as the worst case of traffic of any of the rich nations. And this is something that Israel has, has not been able to solve in spite of, in spite of some good um, investments in infrastructure. And as the very last slide, I'll show you this crazy picture from my hometown of Haifa. This is near the shopping mall called Grand Canyon, not too from, far from the Technion. And this is while they were building the tunnel and the roads there that I travel on whenever I go back to visit. Um, it doesn't show a pkak, a traffic jam, but it, it is a crazy picture and I like to show it. So thank you very much. Yes, please.
Yeah. So, do you agree, or to, 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 what degree, to, to, to what degree do you agree about this statement? That the influx of highly uh, educated Soviet Jews in the 1990s helped Israel. So there was no coincidence that this happened in this, this specific age and time. Yeah, the question is about the, the Soviet Jews' uh, impact on, on the, the big high-tech boom that began in the 1990s. And, and I think that the, 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 the big wave of Soviet Jews did have an impact. Um, I personally have not seen a study where that's been looked at empirically. To what extent did they really make a difference? Um, the, uh, the OCS, the, uh, the Inno Israeli Innovation Authority, did something very interesting. They created an incubator program for the the Soviet Jews who, were, who came with a STEM background, and they, um, uh, there were thousands of them engaged in what is essentially incubators, uh, for startup incubators, and then, and so that was a, a nice effort. Um, I, um, so I think it, w it, it was one of the contributors, yes. Somebody else. Yes, please. Um, I also like to ask you about another uh, external factor. Um, do you think that the um, uh, Jewish Americans have played a positive role in promoting the, these uh, startups? Yeah, and I think that the, the example of Startup Nation, the book itself is an example of that. Uh, it, it's, it's written by, um, by Jewish Americans. I, I, I want to take you back to that slide of the national, where, where all the bubbles were, all the ovals. And really, you could put there um, uh, the, uh, the American Jewish community, I think, uh, appears in a number of those in terms of all the connections, uh, the, the, the flow of money, uh, the flow of, of information, the introductions that the American uh, Jewish community can make to Israeli startups once they come here to the United States and so on. So I, I think that that's a nice point. Yes, please. You mentioned the cooperation between the public sector and the private sector rather than competition. And how influential was, could you trace us back to what was called the Mapach in 1977? Was this the, the roots of a lot of what's happening in Israel today? Now oh, that's interesting. So the question was, to what extent was the, um, the move away from the, I'll, I'll rephrase it, the move away from the socialist uh, ideal of 1977 uh, uh, influential in this? I think, I think it certainly had, uh, had, had some important uh, impact. Why? Because the, the wave of privatization, of denationalization that, that happened in Israel really began in the, it essentially actually began in the 1970s, even before the Mahapach. Um, uh, but, but certainly it, it, um, it continued well into the 80s and 90s. Um, so it was not just that. Um, you know, if you look at the, the post office, for example, or the Ministry of Communication, it began to take steps towards denationalization already in the 1970s under the labor government. Yes, please. Okay, this is a somewhat impolite question, but you've kind of drawn me to it. When I think of your last slide and your first slide, I have to wonder how it is the most deeply, richly innovative country cannot innovate its way out of the cock. And where the answer lies for me is in that diagram with the 10 or 12 ovals and such, which is I don't see various public interests shaping the innovations that, are, that you're describing. I mean, the military shows up. But what about the others that would want roads and schools and bridges and the other infrastructure, the social shaping of technologies in the direction of public good? <clears throat> I, I think that's a great question. And, and it's really not one of the ones I, I put on as one of my worrisome or problematic list, and perhaps I, I should have. Um, there are a lot of externalities, again, in an economist term, of, of the startup nation that um, are negative externalities, and, and this certainly might be one of them. Yes, please. Uh, Judge Brandeis warned about bigness. Big, big companies, big government, and um, there's a great fear that the big tech companies, Google, Facebook, are just have gotten so big that they're they're sucking out not just in the United States but in the world 
innovation. And I was wondering if you could comment on what the effect of these mega uh, tech companies, the negative effect that it's happening, uh, having on Israel and innovation in Israel. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me start with the, the positive in that. Israelis are very proud that, that Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Intel all have huge operations in Israel, a multi-locational, multi-sectoral, uh, across uh, many aspects of innovation, um, and they employ many people and, and bring a lot of money into Israel. Um, Look, uh, I think anyone who, uh, who wants Israel to be successful wants Israel to develop some of its own mega corporations. So when Teva began to decline a few years ago, that was a disappointment not just to the shareholders of Teva, but really for all Israelis, Teva, the big pharmaceutical company. Um, and um, um, so I, I, I'd like to see Israeli companies become big. Um, but Jeff, I'm not sure I answered all of your question. Are, are we concerned that Google is big in Israel too? Is I think is your question. No, it's more that you have these companies that have gotten too big. Um, they it, it suppresses innovation. It, it suppresses innovation. Right. And um, the, the, co the cover of the Economist, I think, this week is how the EU is. Is, right. is taking on these companies. In the United States, regulators have been less so willing to do it. And um, so there's a fear in the United States there's, there's going to be less economic growth because there's going to be less innovation because these companies have gotten too big. And, and Europe, I think, is a little further ahead. And how is, I mean, I, I think your point that Israel has benefited from all the foreign direct investment, but at the same time, in the, in the long term, is it going to also negatively affect innovation and startup nation because these companies are just too big and it, it, it hurts innovation. There, um, Jeff is asking, to, to some extent, we're seeing signs of this here in the United States that because these, these tech giants are so big, they are, um, there's a kill zone around them. They're, they're stifling innovation around them. Um, and so the publications like The Economist and others are writing about that. Um, I think it's too early to tell in Israel. Israel is, uh, is, is different than the US. Uh, so I'm not sure I can answer that, Jeff. It's a, it's a very interesting question. I, I just don't know. Yes, please, uh, in the back. I already asked a question. So why are you one of these other people? OK, Elon. Um, what are the alternatives for creation wealth? It can't be agriculture. It's a small country. There are a limited amount of diamonds in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and a country of the size of Israel, uh, as you noted before in your, your slides, your uh, presentation, when it reaches a certain level, it can't go beyond it. It can't manufacture man automobiles. It can't engage in mass marketing. So where would the uh, salvation be? Would Israel want to maintain its place within the OECD and to be a country of increasing wealth, if not through this method? That's an excellent question. Are there alternatives to startup nation as, as a model for development? Um, I think uh, uh, I answered that just a little bit in the very end when I, I said that Israelis are concerned that, that um, uh, there are no, that there are almost no comp companies that, that exceed uh, Nissan's ceiling of $5 billion in value. Um, so, um, uh, that, that, that would be an alternative model, that Israel builds, uh, builds large corporations that employ many thousands of people at the same time and, and, that, and create wealth that way. Uh, the Germans have done that well with their Mittelstadt. Uh, excuse me, there's German-speaking people here if I mispronounce that. That's the mid-layer of businesses that the Germans have done very well in developing and other nations have not so much. Um, so those are some other models. Um, yes, please. Uh, this is a follow-on to the first two questions, which were about different uh, groups of Olim, different uh, immigration groups. Uh, uh, anecdotally, I worked in a startup in the uh, mid-'80s, a software engineering startup, uh, before all the venture capital was available. And I thought what, was, what I saw, and just as a business guy, not as a technologist, was that there were so many technologists and scientists from different countries who had learned in different <coughs> kinds of school systems with fundamentally different assumptions 
and that the conflict you know, between them was often a source of innovation. And I, I guess, uh, the, the, to bring me to the question, to what extent um, might, be, you know, might, this, might there be a special sauce in the ability to bring different groups together, not keep them separate, but you know, engage them and, and their different starting assumptions in the innovation process? Yeah, there's been enormous uh, interest <clears throat> ever since I've, I've been a young academic in the notion of w what are better teams? Is the better team a homogenous team where there's less friction because of any kind of backgrounds? Or is a better team um, a diverse team? Um, and uh, there, there's so many studies about that. Um, and Israel, I think, is an interesting case because it's a, both a country which is to some extent homogenous um, and in another way, it's, it's, it, it isn't homogenous. It's built up of many ethnicities. Um, um, so uh, we, we don't have the diversity that we have here in the United States where we have Indians and Chinese and um, American-born all working in the same teams. And in Israel, it's, it tends to be more homogenous. I, I, so I don't have an answer to that. I, I think that, um, personally, I think that some of the studies um, are pointing us in the wrong direction, saying that either homogenous are better or diverse are better. I, I don't think that there's one right, right answer to that. I think that, uh, um, that that's an insufficient measure of, of their success. It, it is certainly one measure, perhaps, but not a determining one. Yes, please. Um, the entertainment industry seems to be a, a place that cannot get enough content. I mean, more and more content is desired. And Israel certainly has begun to make its mark in the entertainment industry. Do you see this as, as a place where, where you know, Israel is going to become a, a more dominant uh, figure? Or do you see this industry as a place where Israel is going to become a more dominant figure? Yeah. Uh, the, I think you're right. Uh, my, my anecdotal observation is that the Israeli entertainment business is doing well. The Eurovision is coming to Israel uh, in a few, few weeks. Um, so uh, I think that uh, that might be successful, but, but beyond that, I can't really speculate. All right, are we out of time? Should we do one more question? All right. Uh, oh, Jonathan, you get to choose. Hi, I just wanted to know if you could um, say a few words about the impact of um, the production of wealth of, out of the startup nation on um, Israeli politics. So for example, who are, what, what political influences that they had? You know, are, they, are they pushing, pushing the politics left, right, um, somewhere else? <laughs> and um, and um, you know, does it, obviously, I mean, you could turn it the other, you could also, if you have thoughts about how current Israeli politics are, um, trying to either foster or promote or hinder um, the wealth created by this new sector? Yeah, that's a lovely question. I've looked briefly at your question because I was curious about it as well. If we look at the United States, we know that Silicon Valley is, is liberal. So it, it's been in the Democratic anti-Trump ca camp, if you will. And so with that prism, um, when, we, when you look at Israel, it, it, it's not quite as clear. <clears throat> If you look at the, the dominant uh, um, high-tech high tech people who are in the Knesset or were recently in the Knesset, it's mixed. So, so there's Bennett, uh, who is right-wing, of course. And there's Arel Margalit, who uh, just left the Knesset a few years ago, and he's Labor Party. He was the head of uh, one of the big Israeli venture capital companies. Uh, there's the former mayor of Jerusalem, whose name I'm blanking on. Barkat, yeah, um, who is Likudnik, I would say, the moderate uh, part of Likud. Um, you know, those are the three ones that really came to mind uh, when, I, when I gave that a thought. Um, maybe somebody can add to my list here. Um, huh. Yeah, all right. all right. We're out of time. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carmel, for that amazing and excellent lecture. For, for those of you who haven't met me yet, I am Dr. Shana Weiss. I am the Associate Director of Schusterman. Um, we are thrilled that you are here. We are going to now have a short break. Please get some coffee, get some more snacks, and we will reconvene at 10.30. Thank you.